So welcome along. Um, I'm Rob from Plan Grow Do with Steve uh, and another Steve uh, who we'll get to in just, just a few seconds. Um, we're here today to talk about, I guess, and address the, the topic of mindset, personal development, and where it plays its part in more traditional B2B sales, B2B development, and what impacts that might have on the organization as a whole and how it can contribute to achieving business goals uh, and objectives. Um, myself and Steve here aren't particularly experts around that topic, so we thought we'd bring one in. Uh, and we're delighted to have with us on screen today uh, the very handsome Steve Judge, uh, yeah. who is a professional speaker, a workshop facilitator on the topic of mindset and personal development. And Steve, good afternoon to you. Uh, it'd be lovely to introduce yourself and give us a a brief history of time of Steve Judge, if you don't mind. What, what brings you here? Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and nice to see you, Steve, as well. Uh, like <laughs> Steve, that's always nice to, to get us in the room. So a brief introduction of me. So where do I start? So I had a, a near fatal car accident, 2002. That was a massive change in my life. We talk about mindset. Mindset was a massive thing then uh, to have a positive mindset because I was told that I may never walk again. That's a mindset in itself. It's a fight or flight. I could have just rolled over in bed and given in. Uh, for me, I decided to fight. And I had to go through a lot of rehabilitation, grow my leg back even, learn to stand again, learn to walk again. But throughout that, having a positive mindset, setting goals and working towards them and seeing the, the success, what I had achieved. And I like that. Who, who doesn't? So I think I realised after that, you know, what more can I do? I also had this this deep anger of the accents the the thing that had taken things away from me I always say I always said and always say and forever will do that the accident changed my life it didn't ruin my life and again that's a positive mindset so I was thinking how can we make it change for the better I think this comes down to you can't things happen to us and you can't you know change how things what, what, what things happen to us but you can make a difference on how you react to those things and so that's what I'm doing I'm reacting to that change so more physical goals I got into swimming got into cycling found this thing called para triathlon which is triathlon for disabled people both my lug my, my legs were disabled uh, competed as a disabled athlete set goals worked towards them became a British champion European champion and then world champion so I retired from international competition in 2014 and ready for the next part of my journey and that was to to, to spread the word share the, the the messages and the tools what i'd learned and to help other people I, I, what frustrates me is, is what my goal what my drive is 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 people just flatlining through life and not grabbing those opportunities maybe not even being happy and i just think well, why you, that's crazy you, that's what life is all about about being happy and i know what that that means and i know what that is so now as a professional speaker, workshop facilitator, author, I'm helping people, I'm empowering people to find out what it is that they really want in their life. Um, and that can be anything, it could be academics or sport or fitness or love or whatever, whatever that thing is for them, for their teams, for their family, for everybody, and then giving them the tools to work towards it, the inspiration, the motivation, and the book that I'm writing at the moment has got the five winning strategies for them to actually do that. And that's that gives me a real joy, a real glow, because it's all in my head at the moment. And I'm finally putting it into a book. Once it's in the book, that's almost like a journal, a, a guide, as it were, for them to go on their own journey, along with everybody else, and achieve what they really want to. Their goal, as I would call it, which for me stands for your goal, your opportunity, your love, and your dream. So I'm always looking for opportunities to do that. Teaming up with you two, Rob and Steve, is, is a perfect way to do that. And yeah, let's see where we can take this. Yeah, I, I mean, it's fascinating, really, isn't it? Because if you think about, if you think about the side we know, the profession of sales, it's a common belief that there aren't many people in sales that actually chose to be there. <laughs> it, it's almost like, what else is there left to do? And 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 I and I think that's a very interesting connection between how you see um, that personal drive and challenges creating obstacles that through mindset you overcome. And in our space, potentially a population of people that inconveniently are there 
and the fear that what we're doing is just having a job, having a career, managing time, and actually just getting to the end of the quarter for bonus, the year for the awards. But is there that real definite purpose for being there? And, mm. and I think that's a really fascinating topic in a particularly an environment where we've just had two years where the majority of sellers in this B2B direct space have been fundamentally challenged, right? Mm, absolutely. Yeah, there's been barriers. And you mentioned there, Steve, about that people just flatline through life. And I think not quite as drastic as that, but you're right. I think people always fall into sales roles by accident. So therefore, how can we, I guess, how can we um, start with self-development in this space? Because it's often overlooked. Mm. I'm just here because it's a job. I get busy. What does it matter? Um, so therefore we neglect ourselves a bit. And, mm. I, and I think, why should we look after ourselves a bit more here after two years of what has challenged us? We've all had things happen to us, as you say. So how can we start to use that time to think, well, what can I, how, why is it important to look after me? You know, why do you think it, it is so, Steve? For me, I think people have had a bit of a wake up call because of the pandemic. Um, things aren't as stable as they thought they were. Now, I had that with my car accidents. Um, you know, I did nothing wrong that day. There were no other cars on the road. It's just some water on the road. It's just a bad accident. Nobody could have seen that coming. A bit like the pandemic. Nobody saw that coming and it happened. So suddenly people are thinking, you never know what's going to happen now. Maybe I should start doing a little bit more of the things that I really want to. People were furloughed. Um, not everybody, uh, but some people were. And that gave them a new look at life. Um, and you know, again, you've got different people doing different things. And I think through the furlough or through the pandemic, because we could digress quite a lot on this, but I think that you did a, a couple of things through the pandemic. So you either became a, a hunk, a drunk or a chunk. Um, so I think you either, you started working out on yourself, you know, a bit of fitness and health. You drank a little bit more for survival and you ate, you know, all the wrong food, a hunk or drunk or a chunk. Now, personally, I did a bit of everything. Um, now, I think as it came out, I did start looking because I thought it was only going to be for about three months. I started thinking about, you know, when's this going to finish and what do I want to be like when I come out of it? When I meet people for the first time, I would like for them to, to look at me and go, wow, Steve, you're looking well. And th that was it. That was my drive. I thought, right, I want to be still alive, survival. I want my business to be flourishing and I want to be looking well. So, you know, I was working on my fitness, but not everybody does that. And I think the, the pandemic has realized that everybody's different as well. And for various reasons, you know, we, we just can't compare. And I keep saying that because we've all been in the same storm, but we've all been in very different boats, some small boats, some, you know, one man boats, but some ocean liners, some, some, um, some boats with sails and people have had to adjust those sails to, to match the storm, to get through it to the other side, to the lighthouse. So we can't compare, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how people have, dealt with it differently and I would say that goes into a bit of a, an 80-20 split um, that's what I found in my research for my book at the moment is that if we talk about high achievers they generally be they're only about 20% of people are high achievers and those 20% of people do one thing different they do a few things different but the one major thing different than the people that are not high achievers and that's focusing on what they want to achieve that's it now, for me, I was thinking about what I want to look like at the end of the pandemic when I meet people face to face. So I was focusing on what I wanted to achieve. I wasn't focusing on, I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be fat. I don't want to be unhealthy. I don't want to be poor. Because that's, I know it sounds like it's positive, but you're actually focusing where you focus, where your focus goes, the energy flows. So you focus on what you actually want to achieve. And so that is what, you know, employers have found, I think, with the change in mindset. These employees are coming back to work now and some of them are thinking about what they want to do. I want to be happy. What do I need to do to be happy? I was happy when I was furloughed. I was spending time with the family. Oh, the family, that was nice. I want to spend more time with the family, maybe a four day week, maybe retire early. And I think it's employees or employers need to realize that and encompass it. They need to find out what makes their employees tick as the team and the individuals and then work with them to achieve that. Instead of repelling it, accepting it, 
And how do you do that? Well, by asking them, by talking to them, by doing workshops to find out what their goal is, I, I would call it. Is it money? Is it time? Is it you know, flourishing? Is it education? Is it you know, personal development? Find out what that is. And then they can all work together. So uh, that's my theory. Does that sound about right? Do you think? Well, I mean, I think so. Is it, you mentioned there that you think there's sort of a, your research is suggesting 80 20. And I guess that's what 20% of the people in a population are more inclined to self development and 80% aren't, or 80% are and 20% aren't. Yeah. What, so it's the 20% that are. And, and, and I think you know, we've all been, to use your metaphor, on a boat somewhere in a storm. Mm. Um, I guess for the, I guess for these people of in our profession in this sales B two B sales space, they all have access to more information and more learning and more insight than, well, certainly my grey hair or lack of hair would imply <laughs> I had when I was younger. The ease of getting it, let's put it that way. Yeah. So I guess that is a, at the nub of the question. What what is it that stops the eighty percent feeling that they are entitled or empowered to grab the same gold that the twenty percent are happy to go after? What are some of the things that you see that prevent people investing in an equal opportunity, perhaps, to develop themselves, their skills, and their capability? What stops them? So. A big question I, I like to ask people is, um, are you happy or are you content? Are you both? Are you neither? Or whatever. And I thought it was like a fixed formula, fixed rule. And I, I did some research into this, but I realized that it, it, it isn't because everybody's different. So I'm, I'm very happy in what I'm doing at the moment as a professional speaker, uh, but I'm nowhere near content. I've got so much more that I want to do um, before I you know, pass on to the next life. So I'm not content, but I'm very happy. However, some people, to me, haven't got the best job in the world, but they're, they're quite happy in that job, plodding along. They're quite content, um, you know, finishing at half four, going down the pub or, or doing whatever they want to do. So I, I, I can't use that. So what is it that stops the 80 percent? I don't know. And it baffled me initially. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a quote or question of the what hell is. So hell on earth is and this is this really splits people. Hell on earth is getting to the end of your days and meeting the person that you could have become. So it's quite deep, but if you think about it, do you accept that or do you reject that? And I, I read that and I thought, I don't, I don't get that because when I'm on my deathbed and I meet the person that I could have become, that person is the loser. They're, they're the waste of space. They're the person that didn't get off their ass. They didn't do anything to just watch Netflix. They just ate too much. I'm not that person. I'm the other person, that's who I am on my deathbed. I'm completely exhausted, I've got no regrets, I've been the best that I could be, uh, I've done all these amazing things. Other people don't have that. And that's because they're going through life living it with, with regrets. They're getting to the end of the day and they're, they're regretting eating, drinking too much, wasting their time, not doing things, not doing personal development. They, they regret that, but they do it day after day after day, week after week, after month after month. So the big question is why? Why do they do that? Yeah. And I can say here, I have no idea because they're just different people. But what I found is that um, people, for, for, for one, nobody's actually asked them. Nobody's actually asked them, what is it that you really want? What makes you happy? Now, happiness is a, is a different subject altogether. There's two types of happiness. There's eudonomic and hedonic happiness. Hedonic happiness is very quick. Um, it's like uh, a lust. It's like buying a lottery ticket and hoping that you'll win. It's like eating chocolate cake, uh, maybe watching a good film. It's, it's quite instant, very quick. Uh, eudonomic takes longer. It's something more like flourishing, like when you study for three years and you finally get your certificate and that makes you happy. That's a flourishment. Uh, getting fit and healthy takes a long time to do. So you flourish and you, it's eudonomic. So which one do you need? Big question. Do you need hedonic or eudonomic? The answer, which they found, and again through my research, is you need both. You need a bit of both. But some people are just stuck on, on the one, the quick one, the quick fix. And they keep buying those lottery tickets and they, they keep losing and it's, it's not working. Yeah, by all means, buy that. You need a little bit of that sometimes, but you've got to do the flourish as well. So think about what makes you happy. Get people to ask them. But then the other thing I think that I think we can all agree is what's stopping people from, from personal development and, and reaching their goals is time. 
you know, people say, I haven't got time to do that. Time's a big thing. Yeah, time, time is a big thing. We, but the thing is that the answer is we, we've all got 24 hours in the day. So, you know, it depends what you do with your time. It depends how you cultivate your time as to what you achieve. And it's about splitting it down. I've got this quote. Let me just read this quote out because I love this. Uh, I think it was from James Clear. Uh, he says, if the only reason you're not pushing, if the only reason you're not pursuing a dream is because of the length of time it will take to achieve it, you should start right now. And I just thought, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's very blunt, isn't it? Because that's the thing, isn't it? And that goes in with this other quote that I found. Um, we often greatly overestimate what we can achieve in the short term and yet underestimate what we can achieve in the longer term. So again, that's quite deep and maybe we can put these in the chat for people to read. But again, you know, we, if we want something, sometimes we want that now. I, I, I want to be fit now. I want to lose weight now. Let's go on a fad diet and do that. So I want to be educated. I've got this new book. I'm going to read it in a week. It doesn't take, you can't do those things. It takes longer time. And we get a little bit impatient and we go, oh, I'm, I'm going to quit because that's not working. We've got to calm down. We've got to think about the long term thing. And if we did that, if we just read one page of that book every single day, eventually would get there. So it's about you know, not overestimating, but being realistic about what we need to do. Because we see this, Rob, don't we? When we work with companies, this quick results thing. Yeah, mm. it, it's and, I, and I'm sort of sat here listening to Steve and I'm wondering about the balance that we're seeing coming back to work, recovering numbers. All, we've all got to be back together as a team really quickly. We've mm. all got to be working together seamlessly you know, I'm taking the boat forward in the right direction all together. And actually, there's a lot of quick behavior, quick wins, quick mindset. Everything is about the now. And we see this, don't we? We, we do. see this. It's almost like, uh, and I've just been jotting some notes now while you were, you, you were chatting there, Steve. It's When we were in lockdown, I don't think employers, organizations, industries appreciate how it's affected the individual. They see in black and white how it's affected numbers. Yeah. And they'll say, it's affected our bottom line, therefore we need to chase bottom line. Uh -huh. And they don't think about the actual people on the tools mm. who are there to achieve that number at the bottom line. Yeah. And I guess it plays into a bit of that great resignation that we've seen. Um, you know, People that have had furlough, they've had time away from work to assess, like you said, I enjoyed spending time at home. If my workplace can't give me that now, I'm off. But then I also see a group of people where, they appreciate or they knew how much they enjoyed that that time on reflection but then when they're allowed to go back to the workplace <laughs> they've just gone straight back to working 80 hours a week yeah. working more 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 to chase that quick win to get us back to where we were as quick yeah. as possible and there's a real split i see in, in in those two personas personalities yeah and i think leadership and organization has to play a part in this about how they can support a, a transition back I'm not going to say the normal word, but a transition back to a hybrid or changed workplace. And that has to start by looking at the people, doesn't it? So you're yeah. saying, Rob, in that you're saying, and Steve, could jump in on this. You're saying that you think an employer now needs to more, be more deliberate in creating the space for self-development or, or self. I, th I think they have to. I mean, I'd like to know um, Steve's input from that, but also on a tangent to that, Steve yourself went yeah. back in the day when you worked in large corporate. Yeah. What were the perceptions around that? Was that allowed to happen? Because if we see now that that needs to happen, that's an evolution. And if the leadership at the top come from that more traditional background, are they preventing their staff achieving the bottom line number? Because we well, didn't have that in my day. Mm. Yeah, so maybe Man, jump to jump yeah, to Steve. Yeah. The, Steve in the other room yeah. first. The other Steve. The other room. I'm here in the other room, just listening to him. <laughs> um, so yes, so I, I love this this quote um, that we all have two lives. Our second one starts when we realise we only have one. Now I I focus on that about my accident. You know, I I, I survived it. I had a near fatal near near death experience, and when I I came round, I realised. I'd only got one life, I better start living it, which sounds a bit of a cliche, but what it means, what it did to me then was it emphasized everything that had happened before that car accident, my childhood, my, my young adult years. And suddenly that was all emphasized to survival. I had this new mindset about what I was gonna do, what I needed to do. 
because of this massive big change in my life. So where are we now? So I now want to be that change in other people's lives by, by sharing my story. I don't want anybody to go through what I went through. They don't need to. I've learned from it. I can share that and my book, my workshop does that. However, in a way, recently, a lot of people have been through a very traumatic experience with the pandemic and they are going back to work with a different mindset and they're looking at things differently. And yeah, like you said, there's, there's two different versions of those people. Some people actually liked it at home and other people didn't like it at home and are quite happy to get back to work. But either way, their mindset will be slightly different. And it's up to, I feel, it's up to the employer to understand what's going on in, in the employees' minds as a team, as a network, so that they can work with them, find out what's going on, work with them to, to go towards um, a company goal, but understanding everybody's individual needs. And once you take that on board, then you can all work together in harmony, but that's how it should be. To, to deny that and say, right, let's crack on where we left off is the wrong thing to do, in my opinion because things have changed, mindset, physical, everything, the world, uh, you know, everything's changed. And I think it's up to the employers to, to realise that and do something. And, I, I mean, just before I answer the question you asked yeah. me a moment ago, I just want to underline an experience I had very recently. We, we help mentor uh, sales leaders. And one of the most recent engagements I had with, with one sales leader told me of two examples of their staff. One had an absolutely wonderful experience during furlough because they had time to spend with their new baby. They had time to get to really engage. And they had such a nice time that there's now a second baby. <laughs> now, well, that's, yes, indeed. It told me in a, a, a member of the team, more traditional, probably a slightly different journey in life at a different stage of their life, had a very, very lonely furloughed experience and actually was longing to get back into work, to get back to that normal. So I, I, I echo the point you're saying. And then there's this thing about the, and if we've got that, those two diametrically opposed returns back to work, surely the employer has to recognize that they have a different frame and we have to therefore behave and respond differently. Yeah. But if I come to your question, what it was like back in the day when I was heavily involved in corporates, well, self-development, you know, we all had a budget. It didn't matter what the self-development was. We had X thousands of pounds to invest in each individual. And that, that spend was probably a spend that we made on training that was linked to an outcome. And that was linked to probably a business measurable number. Yes. That was probably linked to something like more sales or more a better hit rate or you know conversions or whatever it would be but it was definitely linked to a tangible return on investment. There was nothing in the space that I'm hearing us focusing on that we must be creating a safe space to work, a confidence um, to be comfortable in who you are and how you wanna present yourself, to create loyalty, to actually just create and nurture that environment. And that's a very different set of motivations to self-development isn't it where before we might have said well there's a course read a book or there's a trainer we'll bring them in mm -hmm. we're actually saying self-development now is probably more multifaceted because of the pandemic and how it's given us all these different experiences akin to you know not not, not similar i would say but akin to where you were steve that we've all we've all had these moments that have now punctuated our lives and I recognize this through just my children, you know, 20s, their frame on life and what tomorrow is, is very different to what I perceive tomorrow as. Theirs is about freedom. Mm. Theirs is about choice. Theirs is about, you know, no regrets. Um, mm. where, where I'm probably from a position of being a bit more protective to tomorrow than free about tomorrow yeah and, and therefore um steve in the other room don't organizations have a responsibility to create that that culture and facilitate that space and opportunity if um you know not necessarily money is the motivator anymore here's some more money i don't want that yeah here's more freedom oh great yeah. give me that and I'll be more loyal. Do you see that play out in the organization? Yeah, you, and you just mentioned the word loyal and, and Steve mentioned loyalty as well. And I think that's for me is the one that rings out a lot is that is to get that loyalty from the employees because 
um, I think people have seen that it's a, it's a big world out there and, you know, they, they got through the pandemic and, okay, everybody's different, but, you know, they survived. And they're going, well, if I survived that, then maybe if I left this job and, and found something bigger and better, the grass maybe is greener on the other side. However, as an employer, you want the, you want retention, you want loyalty. So again, it's that understanding, well, what, what, what will make you loyal? Is it money? Is it time? Is it, you know, facilities? Uh, we were talking uh, when we had a meeting earlier about, you know, when they did that survey about what the employees want. And out of the questionnaire, the biggest thing that would make the difference and make them happier was better quality coffee. And you're like, oh my goodness, is, is that it? That's all we need. And it, it might be as simple as better quality coffee, but it might be more than that. It might be, like we said, a four day week or early retirement. It could be lots of things. Find out, find out what these people want as a team so that the business can be, can, can flourish and move forward. Yeah, I, 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 like, I like this loyalty question. I think it's really important if we can, help look after the individual to create and contribute to a wider culture, we get better loyalty. And you mentioned retention, um, yeah. Steve. Ah, Steve, retention and loyalty, can, if personal development plays a big part in mm. my happiness, my loyalty, therefore my retention, what's the, what's the benefit that we can start to see from organisations in improving loyalty and retention? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, and this has been a massive change mm. in the space that I've been. I, I was a job for life. Mm. I was in Shell for 23 years. My intention was to be in a job for life. Um, the research suggests that people really only stay in jobs for five years now. You know, they're much more transient in their careers. And therefore, as an employer, you have to accept you're developing people to be successful, probably outside of your company. Mm. That's, a, that's an interesting mindset mm. because that is a real test of leadership. But if you take it down to B2B sales, the space that we operate in, the average tenure of a B2B sales rep executive is 16.9 months. Oh, wow. Now, this is based on the fact that false promises are made. The environment to fit the individuals isn't nurtured. Chasing targets becomes the dominant driver. No career opportunities become the blocker. So 16.9 months is where people are tracking. The average is five years. There is a clear delta yeah. between the environments that selling companies are creating for their employees. And I do believe this aspect, uh, this aspect of self-development plays a real contributing factor to a multiple of, of achieving somewhere closer to help close that gap to close yeah, that gap yeah. yeah interesting there's that branson quote isn't there <laughs> what is it train people so they're good enough to lead leave but create the environment that they don't want to yeah and i yeah. think that's almost plays a part here doesn't it if if there is that gap and we're sharing with employer employers that their employees want a different experience yeah what an opportunity if, if there are organisations who are brave enough to take that, that leap of faith. Um, Steve, I'm, I'm curious what, what changes you've noticed, I guess, more specifically over the past two years in that pandemic window um, in the personal development space? Has it lost some of its stigma? Are people embracing it more? Um, and you mentioned how do, you know, doing personal development. How do we do personal development <laughs> for those that might be new to it in this two-year space i think yeah so yeah so it comes down to the two different types of people again it, there might be more than two but some people have really grabbed hold of that um they might have been furloughed or they might have had more time on their hands over the last two years and they have picked the book up and they had said yeah okay i'm going to get to you know a, a qualification further education and they've really grabbed that opportunity and they've, they've gone with that um, the others haven't, you know, they're, they're just quite happy and content not doing anything, uh, either doing stuff in the garden or doing stuff with the family or, or just watching Netflix. I don't know, it's, it's, but they're different people. So that's one massive difference that I've noticed. When it comes to work, I think there's been a, a very much of a survival thing that I think personal development has been put to one side uh, as people have come back uh, and said, like, that's, that's almost not important anymore. And I obviously disagree with that. I think now is the time to find out more about what that person needs or wants for themselves, but also for the team, for the company. Uh, and they should actually be investing, or at least asking uh, and finding out you know, what there is that they, that they, that they can do uh, to, to make it and move it forward. 
Yeah, and, and I guess if an organization is struggling to, to break that barrier, because if we're talking about a traditional B2B organization mm. where it is park your personal development at the door, we do numbers here. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about, oh, yeah, employers need to embrace it, but they might struggle with it. So what can employers do to get started? How can we start to challenge the perceptions maybe that to help employers just start to create this culture to support employees? What do you think we could be doing more of? I think it's, we've mentioned it before, it's about the outcomes, isn't it? And that might be retention, that might be loyalty, um, because as a business, you need to survive, okay? So you need, you need the money coming in to survive as a business. But you need the employees to, to help with that. So finding out what makes them tick is really important. So what can employers do? Uh, when I talk about my five winning strategies, the first one is finding out your goal, which we've mentioned earlier. So that's what I would do. You can do that as an individual one-to-one -one basis, or you can do this as a group, uh, as a team, uh, as a department. Finding out what the individual's goal is, their goal, their opportunity, their love and their dream, but also what do they want for the business? You know, and, and my exercise that we, that we do, we, we draw a picture. So you draw a picture of you in the future and your employees, your, your employers and your colleagues around you. What are you doing? Is, is the business successful? I hope it is. It's, it's all good and there's money coming in. Everybody's smiling. The, the coffee machine is better now. Uh, you've got a nice company car. You've got all of this. You've got lots of clients. Uh, you're going away on a works do because you're celebrating annual awards. You've got the award for the best, this, that and the other. Find out what you want as a group, as a department, as a business, as a, as a whole, as a company. And then you can all start working towards that. The individual ones, absolutely. You need those as well. You know, and we've mentioned about you know, retirement, four day week or whatever, or more money. Fine. But how they link up, well, that comes down to the leadership. And that comes down to the, the employer working out how the individual's personal development fits in with the overall development of the company, the business. And that's really important. Yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And I, I think there is a, there's a huge opportunity, but also obvious barriers and challenges for an employer and employee to overcome. But if we can start to tie it back into that, this is how it benefits an organization through loyalty, retention, close that gap and, and try and get that average up to more like the five years I and mean, what an opportunity there is like i said for someone to, to yeah I, I think it's massive and i just, I just it, i've been sat here just sort of mentally going through the leaders that i worked for mm. in my in my life and, and i would say the ones that i remember not just remember fondly but remember having a an impact on my on me at that simplistic level are the ones that had that genuine interest in in me so the question understood the family, understood what motivates me, understand my challenges, understand where I, I am in life and provided me the moments to develop those. And that, that, that was taken away from what might be the more normal Shell training, that was Shell I worked for, into something that was much more, um, much more personal. And, I, and I'm thinking, um, my my youngest daughter is is autistic and and i remember my boss at the time could see something was troubling me hugely you know and it had affected my performance because you know if you have something you're unaware of what it what it is um you, you know it just creates this cloud over you and i and i remember working through some support and training as a working dad to how I could accept these challenges in my life. Now, that's nothing to do with sales skills. Mm. That was totally about me. Mm. But after I had that intervention, my connection to my work was fundamentally different. Now, what we're not saying to B2B leaders out there is you have to go to that level of taking those moments. But if you know something is troubling, somebody or there is an opportunity to help somebody that is a self-development space that is is the right place to be driving to driving down i believe and it just made me reflect as you've been talking mm. we've all been talking about what is it that keeps you connected to your work it is that personalization of your development 
And then it's beholden on me to respond or not, fight or flight, as you said earlier, but re respond on me to respond. Mm. And then when I respond, my employee can connect me back to the organizational goals and I'm much more connected back to it. Mm. So yeah, really good reflection that I, that you took me to that place. Yeah, <laughs> it's a real good tangible example, isn't it? Yeah. Because I guess it's a softer, less obvious thing to connect. If you do this, you'll sell why. Mm. But by looking after us and creating that space to look after us, look at the benefits mm. that did come from it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, knowing what your goal is, if I go through the, the winning strategies, knowing what you want at the end of it is, is, is crucial before you can even get started as a business, as a team, as an individual. The next section is finding out your golden soul. And that's exactly what you've just been talking about, Steve, is digging down deep, have these five gold things, five questions that you ask yourself as to, you know, what, will, what do you want and why do you want it and what will you feel like? What will you feel like if you don't get it? And this digs down deep as to why on earth you're working towards it. Again, as a business, as an individual. And it's in impactful for everybody to know what your why is, your colleagues, your boss, uh, everybody around you, so that they can all relate to that. The next bit on there, this is your golden gear, as in what do you need to achieve the, this, this big dream that you've got? Is it, is it more training? Is it personal development? Is it um, better equipment? Is it more money? What is the golden gear that you need? Now, the next one can be quite a fun one. It's called your golden gang. So who do you need? Who do you need on your team to, to make this happen? And you, you think about it, it's very much about um, getting going, like conceivement. Uh, then you've got the achievement section. So who's going to take you to that level? So you achieve, you get those awards, you get the accolade. But then you've got the fulfillment. And the fulfillment is very much about thinking about the future. So that when you get even further than you can possibly dream of, Who's on your gang then? Now, for me, as a business owner, I, I want a, an SEO expert and I want a, a, an admin person. An admin person for me would be great to do all my emails and stuff like that. But I also want um, a masseur to come in, give me a shoulder massage and stuff every now and again. A nutritionist downstairs and a chef. I want a chauffeur that will drive me to my, my speaking gigs. And that can be a bit of fun, but they're written down. That's who I need. That's who I want. That's who I will get. When I achieve that, the last one is your, your golden hour. So how are you going to get this in a time aspect? And that's obviously about having a, a five-year plan initially going from the picture that you drew in your gold. But also once you've got the five-year, you bring it down to, well, what do we need to do in four years, three years, two years? What do we need to do by the end of this year, this month, this week, this day, this hour? And it's, it's drilling down on all those things so that everybody can see. And, and again, this is an open thing so that everybody can see what they're working towards how they can help each other, collaboration, understanding of what's going on in every single aspect of that. And I think it's all about being open to, throughout the whole of this so that people can understand why you're doing it and where you're going. Mm. No, it's lovely to get a sort of overview of, of your sort of approach and the, and the reference to goal. And yeah, some of it sounds like you have a bit of fun with it as well, which I, th I think oh, yeah. is wholly important yeah. to make this fun as well, isn't it? It doesn't yeah. all have to be... Um, I guess it's stigma led and woolly, it can be a good bit of fun. And I think that's if that's what we can embrace as an employee and get employers to, to buy into that too, then what an opportunity we got. Um, Steve, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, so we're probably going to um, head into the wrap, but I just wanted to share that a lot of what you share or talk about comes from your book. Yeah. Um, this is your biography, is that correct? Yeah. Give, us a, give us a lowdown on the book. What will people get from it? Okay, so a lot of people love it, but I obviously, I love it as well. Uh, my autobiography, Don't Leave On Your Excuses, it is available on Amazon, but if you buy it from my website, then I, I'll sign it and I'll put a, a nice message. What I love about the book is it's my personal story. So when people hear me on the stage, that's 45 minutes, they think they know my story. The book's got more in it. It's got the, the ups and downs, the nitty gritty, but because it was my book, um, I could put whatever I want in it. So it's got poems in it. It's got thoughts and feelings. It's got um, a playlist of the, the tunes, the songs that I listen to to get me through the highs and the lows throughout my journey. It's got lots of photos in. Not enough. I wanted to put more photos in, but it's not a photo album. It's a book. So there's, there's only about 50 photos in it. But it's really good because it will take you through the whole journey of what I've been through and makes you understand why I've done it as well. So that was really good, and I recommend that to anybody to, to go and buy the book. The book that I'm writing at the moment, quickly springing onto that, is more of a business book. 
because what I want to do is, as I've already said, I want to empower and help and inspire people. And that's kind of telling people what to do in a nice way. The autobiography was just, it's all about me, to be honest, all about me. Uh, people will get some stuff from, of course they will. The business book is more about them, it's more about the people, the teams, so that they can read through it. There's exercises in it that will take you, you click on the link, it will take you to, to my website, where you can download forms, do the exercise through each of the chapters so that by the end of the book, you'll, you'll know what your goal is, you'll be on your way to achieving it, maybe not fulfillment, but that's what I really want to do. Uh, the workshop comes from the book as well. So very exciting about that. That will probably come out later this year. Um, watch, watch out on social media. That's all I can say, because I'll be shouting very loud about when it comes out. But yeah, I'm buzzing about it. It's going to be great. Well, as part of your golden gang, we'll be shouting about it as well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, Steve, it's been a pleasure chatting to you, sir. Uh, thank you for hopefully breaking down a bit of the stigma and perception that prevents people grasping personal development it's fascinating how we can start to connect this back to organizational culture as well yeah. uh, i think it's a really important step so thank you for taking time out with us today uh steve judge will um we'll see you very soon thank you it's a pleasure take care mate bye-bye yeah